as we yeah. worship it tonight as well, you know, the Spirit of God is what brings us together. And I know it's kind of, it sounds a little cliche, but that is the, the reality. Um, as I was in the, in the back row, there's a whole bunch of people back in New Jersey that love Jesus, that are passionately singing the same song. You know, this last song that we sang, right? Like I, and I told uh, the keyboard player, she's on the worship team, I said, I can't get through that song. We've been singing it for like a year and a half without crying, like I'm crying. Hey, Jesus for my family. How many, need, how many have somebody in their family that, like, it, it brings to mind some of my, I come from a large, I'm one of eight kids, I, I, all kinds of siblings that have their own ideas about who God is and, you know, how to, but Jesus formed my family because at the end of the day, that's, that's the only person, that's the only one that's going to change somebody's heart. Anyway, uh, it, it is my privilege and, and really my pleasure to, uh, to share with you this evening. Before I do that, I do want to um, thank Tim and Ellie for hosting us. You guys have been just awesome uh, and, and it really has been a blessing and Pastor Marino, uh, man, uh, we love you. We love you, and, and just thank you so much for the opportunity to come and share, to come minister to the children. And I know I, I, I speak uh, on behalf of the entire team that um, that our hearts are full, and uh, we we've, we've been absolutely blessed to uh, spend some time with you. Uh, what I was uh, sharing with one of the one of the team leaders, um, I always like to, when we have guests at, at our church at Calvary Lighthouse, Calvary Lighthouse, just to give you a little context, we're in New Jersey, we're about 60, we're about an, one hour south of New York City, so just to kind of get where it's, it's considered central New Jersey, uh, in the, the Jersey Shore is what it's called, uh, shore area, so, but we're about, we're about an hour south of New York City, very, very densely populated uh, area of the, the state. The, the church itself is located in uh, the town of Lakewood. And if you ever like Googled Lakewood, New Jersey, it is the largest uh, or, and fastest growing uh, Orthodox <coughs> Jewish population outside of Israel. Mm -hmm. It is just, just so, so, so it's, uh, it's, we're, we're on, um, I don't know, we go, Go, go by acres in you know like we're on uh, it's it's a big campus uh, that that we take up and and we are completely surrounded by uh, an Orthodox Jewish community which is exciting in and of itself uh, because you want to talk about a, a, a people that kind of have a zeal for God but are lost in their in their way to get to God kind of thing because they're so caught up in um, in the law and and uh, the Torah and so on. So I look at it, it's, it's kind of epic uh, in light of what's going on in the world and so on, uh, where, where God has strategically uh, placed Calvary Lighthouse. So keep us in your prayers, if you would. We, we uh, cherish your prayers, and we will uh, continue to pray for you. What, what I would like to do is introduce a team member or two and, and just give them an opportunity. I, I always like a little context, like, who are these people, and you know, what, what's, their, what's their deal, where are they from kind of thing. So I'm going to ask just a couple of our team members to come and share a little bit about their uh, their journey, you know, their their walk with God. Uh, not going to take up a whole lot of time, but I just thought it would it would be uh, helpful to give uh, a little bit of, a little bit more context to who we are. And uh, so I'm going to ask one of our team leaders, Stephanie Cofield, if, if she would come and uh, Stephanie, come on up and just take a couple minutes to share, if you would. Hi. Uh, I'm not quite sure how to begin um, sharing about my testimony. Um, I was um, probably a little kid, like those kids that went upstairs when I first felt what I call the spirit of God and knew that he was real. I was about four or five years old when I absolutely knew without a doubt that God was real. I was grew up and my family went to a Baptist church and I remember one day walking, I'm the youngest, with six of us heading towards church. And there was a church at the end of uh, my neighborhood. We lived in a slum neighborhood, but kids could still run around very freely. 
And for some reason, when everyone went this way, God turned me this way and pulled me to this church. And my mom let me just go to this church. And it was without my understanding back then what I now know to be a Pentecostal spirit-filled church. And I, from that day, loved God. Always wanted to have a relationship with God. Loved going to church. Always wanted to be wherever he was. Um, spent full days every Sunday. Morning till night, I go to church, Amen. go to lunch, leave the church, go to uh, with some friends, and then come back in the evening. It was an all-day experience. Two, three times a week, I'm at the church. Um, but somewhere along the line, um, I love God, but I never got the true message of the gospel. I never understood what Jesus did on the cross and what salvation really meant. So I knew that God was real, but I didn't understand the concept that <laughs> Jesus gave his life for me. And so, you know what teenagers do, you get to be a teenager, life happens, and you become a little bit rebellious, and the more I sinned and knowledgeable sin and made bad choices, the further I felt that disconnect from God, no. um, and I felt this gap getting more and more bigger, but I never knew how to get back to him. And I thought, you know, I'm never going to get back to God. Um, I'm never going to get back to God because I'm this terrible person, and by the time I Got married, I had two boys, I went through a di divorce. I knew for sure God would never have me. And I felt like I'm never going to go to heaven. I'm going to die and go to hell. And I would literally tell people that. I'm going to die and go to hell. But that's okay, I'm going to make sure my two boys go to heaven. So when I went through a divorce, I came to Calvary Lighthouse because they have a school there. And I brought my two little boys to the school and I said, I want you to teach them about Jesus. And, and the, they interview you. And so they ask you all these questions, and he asked me, why do I want my kids to go to church there? And I said, well, because when I die, I'm going to go to hell, but I want them to go to heaven. And he said, what? I'm like, when I die, I'm going to go to hell, but I really want my kids to go to heaven, so I need you to teach them. And he asked me some more questions, and I basically tried my best to pass his test to make sure the boys got it. So <laughs> they took him in, and um. I somehow moved to Lakewood, two minutes from the church, round the corner down the block, and somehow God put me in this community of people that lived in my neighborhood, and every morning when I would open the door to my house, pamphlets would fall out that said Calvary Lighthouse, Calvary Lighthouse, Calvary Lighthouse, and one day, someone invited me to come for a revival. A missionary had come, and I came, and it was my intention to come to church and sit way back there in the back so that I knew there was always an altar call and I knew that I was not going to, in my mind, ever come to God because I had no chance. So I sat in the back and I intended to sneak out the back door when the time came. And the more I sat there and this man opened up the gospel, the real gospel, and he starts talking about Jesus and how his death on the cross you know, would wipe away my sins and I could have a chance at new life. And I remember my head kind of being down, and but I could hear what he said. And I lifted my head and I'm like, for real? And he's saying, you can come now, but I, I'm way in the back now. And in my mind, that's the walk of shame, <laughs> you know. So I'm sitting in the back, but this weight of guilt and shame and everything was just kind of on my back. Um, somehow God just pulled me down that aisle. He pulled me down the path, and by the time I got to the front, uh, I just felt the weight. I don't know if it's the weight of God, the weight of sin, everything was just so heavy, and I fell to my knees and just cried and cried and cried, and everyone that was at the church just wrapped their arms around me and prayed over me, and I'm just spilling out every sorrow, every shame. Um... I don't know, and I don't know if that was like a complete turning point for me, but it was a decision-making point that once I knew, once I knew in my heart that Jesus would accept me back, there was no turning back for me. And I think about it now in terms of whenever I encounter somebody who's rejected Jesus, the main thing I really want to make sure that they know, do you understand that you can come to God? Because a lot of people felt like I feel, felt they think that their sin was so great that he won't have it. And so as long as you understand, if I can get you to understand that and you say, no, 
that's okay. I've done my job, but I don't know where I had that disconnect, and that one little disconnect made all the difference in me, and for me, and for my children. Um, and so I'm very grateful, and I'm just amazed that I'm standing across the world <laughs> telling you guys that Jesus saves. Amen. And don't let anybody walk away not understanding that part. Amen. That there's a chance, you know. So many people I met the other day, I'm sorry. <laughs> but the guy that we met in the street, he didn't understand hope. You know? <laughs> he didn't understand that. And he just, we were trying to talk to him, but he couldn't get that part. And if you could just... Don't ever think those little pamphlets and things that you hand out don't matter. Whoever was sticking them in my door was by God's design. Mm -hmm. And I'm just grateful. So thank you guys. I want to tell you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So then, thank you. Can, can we get one more? Let me get Jesus. Jesus, where are you? Jesus. Come on up here and, and uh, just tell us a little bit about your story, okay, bro? Hey, Jesus Ortega. I'm one of the middle school pastor at Calvary Lighthouse, and um, my walk's a bit, a little bit different. So I grew up. My mom told us about God all the time. She, we had Bible studies like once a week. My dad, he was a heavy drinker, um, so he'd come home late. We'd have to. I remember helping him up the stairs. Now I'm like seven years old, so I'm like this big, and he's like 200 pounds, and we're trying to carry him up the stairs. Um, my mom never stopped praying, no matter what, through the, through the alcoholism of my father, through my rebellious time as a teenager where she wanted us to go to church, and I kind of was like, oh, I'm good, I'll, I'll do my own thing. Um, at the age of about 17, I went to a, a youth group. Um, I got invited by a, a friend at school that I had made. <clears throat> so I said, yeah, sure, I'll go. So I show up there, we're having fun, we're, having, we're playing games in the front, we're talking, we have to know everybody. Um, then we go to the back. So in the back, they're like, oh, we're going to go listen to some music and we're going to hear a, a message. So I go, oh, okay, fine. And I get in the back. You know, it had already started. I get in the back and I see everybody with their hands up like this. So I've never seen that before. So I walk in and I'm like, I'm like this guy just brought me to a cult or something. I don't know where I'm at. I don't want to do this. So then I hung out. I thought, like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to trust this guy. Um, then after the, the worship was over, they explained why we raise our hands, why we surrender ourselves to God that way. Um, shortly after that, um, I got saved, became a usher at the church at like 18. By the age of like 19, I joined the music ministry, and then I fell away. I kind of wanted to do everything. I wanted to do what I wanted to do. God's plan was second to mine. I wanted to be, I wanted to go prof I wanted to be a professional mm -hmm. baseball player. I didn't, I wanted nothing to, to do with, with God. You know, I knew about him. Uh, so fast forward a few years in my adulthood, by the age of like 23, I completely stopped going to church. Um, I had one son and my, my wife now, we weren't together at the time. Um, There's no rocky relationship. It was mostly my fault, but um, I got into hanging out with guys at work and then the alcohol started. So I started drinking every weekend. I'd have friends over at the house. We'd drink till from Friday night till Saturday morning. Sometimes I woke up, they were still, they were still drinking. Um, so that went on for, for quite some time. Then probably a couple years after that, the drugs started kicking in. And it wasn't just marijuana. Marijuana was something that was like before that, it was included with the drinking. And it got to heavier stuff like cocaine. Um, I never really got completely, like, totally addicted to it, but for one full summer, every day, I had to have a little bag. It was just, I needed it to get through my day. I had no energy without it. So I was putting all my, all my money and everything into, into the drugs and alcohol and just hanging out with friends. Um, and then my wife had said, well, she wasn't my wife at the time, now she is. She goes, well, why don't we, go? we have two kids at this time, I'm like 27, 28. And she goes, why don't we try going to church? Let's try to go to Calvary. I was like, well, I've been to another church. I was like, it's, it's got to be the same thing. So no, let's try it. So I said, all right. 
fine, we'll try. So we go a couple times. I'm still doing my same thing. Nothing's changed. I'm like, okay, it's, it's church. Then one day, I walk in. It had to be maybe 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. I was high. I was drunk. I walk into the bedroom. I could barely walk up the stairs. But I walk into my bedroom, and I look at the bed, and my wife is laying down on one, one child on each side, my son and my daughter, and one on each side. And at that moment, it seemed like God just like, bam, came down with a hammer. Because I went from high as a kite to completely sober. And I just stared. I was like, what am I doing with my life? What am I, where am I going? I'm going nowhere. So then shortly after that, we started going to church. Um, like every Sunday, just like, we have to go. We have to go. We have to go. Something, something changed inside of me. Um, so then after that, I we get married. I was like, we have, if we're going to start going to church, we got to do things right. We got we to gotta get married, and we got to do it right. So we did that. About a year later, I joined the worship team. I played keyboard. I played the guitar. played the bass for 10 years there. And then um, during those 10 years, I would help out with youth every once in a while. But then God called me probably about a year ago. I, I I felt to step back from the worship team. Like it was, it was time to to go somewhere else, and I felt God lead me to get more involved with the youth. And ever since then, I just see this God moving in my life in in ways that I, I couldn't even explain. It's just from day to day things that happen, from just meeting meeting new people and everything. It's just this God is just amazing. If you put all your trust in Him. And, and you want to live for him, you're going to. And it's just, I can't wait to see what's going to go on next. I'm, I just started my journey, it seems like. I still got a lot to go. So, thank you. Jesus, thank you. If I could ask the team, if you guys would just stand to your feet once again, please. Just for just a minute. Calvary Lighthouse team, just stand. Um, if, you, if you glance across... The folks that are standing, you'll see every shade and multi different nationalities represented. Uh, and, and that's just how Calvary Lighthouse has developed over the years. Thank you, guys. It's literally everything from the Filipino to the Roma to the, the, um, the German-Irish to, to uh, it, it, everything. So it's, it really is a beautiful congregation that... Um, uh, Jim mentioned that I, I've been a, a part of, I've been privileged to be a part of for uh, uh, roughly 42 years. Right um, I got there right after I got saved. I got saved right out of college, and um, uh, it's, it really has uh, it really has been a blessing. Um, as those of you, I guess that that come here regularly, I know there's some that I met and, and chatted with briefly uh, before service that are here for the first time. Uh, we're going through the book of Mark, right? And uh, we're going to be in Mark chapter 5 this evening. Um, as you open your Bible, if you would, if you have a Bible, to, uh, to Mark chapter 5. Um, It's, it's what I find amazing is that every uh, when I, and I love hearing testimonies about how people came to Jesus and how God uh, in essence tracked you down right over over the course of time and one of the things that it brings to my mind is that um, there there's no such thing as a hopeless case right there's no such, there's no person in the if you think of the, the hardest heart that you know of, the hardest, whether it be a relative or somebody that you work with, there is not a heart out there that God, uh, there's not a heart of stone out there that God can't transform into a heart of flesh. And um, so I, I, love, I love the testimonies. Um, just... Real briefly, I, I, I was not raised in a church, so a little different. That's, that's why I like it. Everybody's a little different. I was not uh, raised in a church. My folks would, would go to a church where it was basically steeped in tradition. You light some candles. You say 
uh, like you say, a certain prayer seven times and whatever you had prayed for would supposedly come to pass kind of thing. So it was not really anchored in any kind of uh, biblical truth. Um, and I don't know, if Steph, I think Stephanie mentioned it earlier. Um, we did a little street evangelism, right, the other day, uh, Pastor Tim, where we're just giving out tracts. Uh, 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 what was that area called? Uh, or in the Old Town. The Old Town. And, you know, and I'm saying this because sometimes it can be discouraging where people, whether it be at work, blow you off or, or you know, you, you, you want to talk to somebody that you love or somebody, even even here, we're, we're trying to, we're giving out tracts um, and people are, they're on the ground in many cases, you know, they, they look at me throw it on the ground or whatever. When I was in college, didn't know Jesus, didn't, uh, was, was far, far from God, never owned a Bible. You, you probably have heard of the Gideon uh, Bible Association. The college that I went to, I remember like it was yesterday, uh, the student center was a long set of steps um, that you'd have to walk up to go get your mail from co- for co- college. And the Gideons would always be at the top of the steps giving out uh, the little green Bibles. Uh, this was years ago. And... I didn't know anything about the Bible. I didn't know there was an Old Testament versus a New Testament. I didn't know anything about the Bible. But I'm here to tell you, it was so convicting. I would take the Bible, keep my head down, and keep going, because I knew that there was something that they had that I needed. I should get that box of tissue. <laughs> Um, Thank you. And so don't underestimate. I guess my point is you can't underestimate what God does based on somebody else's response. Because I would grab it and just keep going, not saying a word. And so a person could very easily, hey, this ain't working, guys. This is not working. What we're doing here isn't working, you know. No, it was working. But you can't base it on how I was responding because it was just God punching me in the head, you know, uh, and, and, and just getting my attention. Um, and it, it, it was a, sh- a couple of short years later that God was dealing with me in another area. My younger brother, who, who was in the Marine Corps on the other side of the country, God was dealing with him. And if, if you know, you know the service, you, you, there's a lot of bad things can happen. You can go down a real sinful path in... In, uh, in the service. He was in the Marine Corps. Anyway, he gets saved and is calling me, telling me he's reading his Bible, saying, what? You're doing what? But meanwhile, someone over here on the other side of the... Of the so you have... He's, when I say over here, California. He's in California. I'm living in Massachusetts on opposite sides of the country, literally, you know, like a four days drive. And God, the Holy Spirit is dealing with him out here on the west coast of the United States. And God is beating me up on the on the East Coast. And, and that was just kind of how God orchestrated events in my life to bring me to that point where I knew that I needed Jesus. Didn't have all, you know, didn't know anything about anything, but I, I, I knew that I needed Jesus. Um, and since then, like I said, it's been my privilege. Uh, I, I'm, I'm would be considered what's known as a lay pastor. I don't know if that's a term that, you know, lay pastor. I don't, I don't, I'm not on campus. What I, I uh, have been a, uh, the principal of a, uh, of a school, a public school in New Jersey for a couple of decades now. Actually just retired. September 1st, I, I just, I just uh, signed off and retired. So I'm, I'm, that's why I was able to be here. Because I, uh, retired. Yeah, amen, amen, amen. <laughs> I have three beautiful, real quick, let me just talk about my family. It's okay if I just pray about my family. Three beautiful young ladies that are, uh, have children of their own, have six grandchildren, all this tall. And uh, it's so many cute little babies running around this morning, right? Oh my goodness. Like, it gets, you know, uh, but, uh, and uh, they all love Jesus. Um, and um, 
it's been my wife and I's privilege to serve at Calvary Lighthouse for, for many years now. And I, I, I don't use that word. You know, it's been a privilege. It really, to serve is a privilege. It's not uh, nothing less. It's nothing less. All right. Matthew chapter, or Mark chapter 5. Let's, uh, let's get to it here, guys. Um, you should know that I normally don't preach on Sundays. And maybe at the end of the service, you'll be like, yeah, now we know why. <laughs> now we know why. <laughs> um, but, uh, so, so real quickly, the Gospel of Mark, there's, and, and again, this is a review probably for, for those of you that are, that are here regularly and for those of you that are, um, are, are uh, just here for the first time, the Gospel of Mark, there's uh, 18, 18 miracles uh, recorded in the Gospel of Mark. Um, there is um, just really a, a, a wonderful testimony to the servanthood the power, uh, the servanthood and the power of, of, uh, of Jesus. Uh, as we know, each gospel has its own perspective on the life of Jesus. But uh, in this um, gospel account, uh, we, we read of the, the power and the authority that is in the name of Jesus. And a clear, and this is part of the reason I love that you guys are doing this chapter by chapter, it's, it's so important, right, to know the truth because when you're anchored in the truth, when your your thinking is anchored in the truth, uh, as as uh, the brother this morning was sharing, when a counterfeit comes your way, you recognize it for what it is. It's no, no, that's that's wrong. And so one of the I, and and I, I really feel this way because I, you know, for the first 22 years of my life, I did not have the a, a biblical mindset, and so some things that would be verbalized or spoken of as truth, this is truth, uh, I didn't have an answer to, even though it didn't sound like, that doesn't sound right, uh, but I'm not sure why. As a believer, now, I can think clearly, right, and with authority, not my own authority, but the authority of Scripture. No, this is what the Bible says. And so, in a very real sense, and, and I say this, especially to young people, um, in a very real sense, you can move forward in life confident, right, or confidently um, in knowing that your life, when anchored to Scripture, is anchored to unchanging truth. As those of us that have been around for a while know, truth can become like a revolving door, right? Um, I don't want to get, I'm not going to wade into like, well, let me, let me, uh, let me just give you an example. This is just one example. Um, I know in um, the United States, and I don't know how much around here, but like, uh, climate change is a like climate change the globe is warming we're blah 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 we're all going to die in the 70s and I don't know if this is way before some of your time here in, in the 70s no less than three times on the cover of Time magazine right the, there's a global frost coming in the 90s there's, in other words, that there was going to be a big freeze over it. And so this is in the 70s, right? I'm in high school at the time. They're telling everybody, listen, there's a global freeze coming, and the earth is going to be destroyed by a global... In other words, everything was supposed to freeze, and there was going to be no food for everybody, and, and so on and so on. So, you know, there's, there's, there's a vested interest in keeping people... Like, like this is a white-knuckle ride through life. When the reality is we don't have to live like that. We do not have... We have the peace... That comes from who? The Prince of Peace. And so we can rest in knowing that, hey, listen, whatever happens, ultimately God is control, right? And again, the whole being good stewards of the earth and all, that's, you know, that's a peace, right? That's a peace, but I'm not revolving my life 
If there's a piece, I'm going to be a good steward of what God gives and provides uh, in every sense of the word. So all that to say that the word of God, uh, Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. If you've never... That, that, that's one of the greatest memory verses ever, right? Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And speaking from someone who has stumbled around in darkness for the first part of their life, I can tell you it is a, it is a joy. It is a joy to walk in the light. Um, and uh, as, it, it, it is a joy. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. Mark chapter 5. Let's, uh, let's get to it here and um, uh, see how far we can get. And uh, um, well, When we read this, right, when we read all of Scripture, but especially when we go through it, like, if we consider, like, I guess, expository, right, expository, uh, where we just kind of open it, a word, the Word of God and we read it. Two questions that we want, that I ask, and that I would submit that it would be a good idea. Like, what does it mean? Is one question you want to ask, and what does it mean to me, right? So those are two kind of inter- two questions that um, you want to ask as you read scripture, whether you be reading the scripture in a service or, or on your own. Many times when there are <clears throat> things that are not understood as you read. Uh, I heard one preacher saying, I think it's good advice, keep reading. Many times, the scripture will explain itself or answer itself as you continue to read. So, as you read scripture, persevere in that reading, and you'll find that, that oh, okay, oh, all right. So here we go. Uh, let's take this first section here, um, Matthew, uh, Mark chapter 5. <clears throat> I'm reading from an NIV version. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance... He ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this, come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on a nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down toward a steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Father, tonight we thank you, Lord, as we open your word that our hearts would be open and that God... um, we would be able to glean some some truth, some good seed that would be applied uh, to our lives and it would take deep root in our heart. And that, God, um, you would continue that work that you've begun in each of us. Uh, uh, God, I pray for um, just this good seed to be sown to our hearts. And, Lord, multiply its fruit. Lord, we love you and bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> As we, as we read any part of scripture, we need to keep in mind that the actual chapter divisions and verse divisions were added much later, right? Everybody understands that much years after uh, the scripture was actually written. They serve a purpose and there, it is, you know, it's a good thing that they are there, the chapter and verse, but like even the letters that Paul writes, they're written as a letter. It wasn't, hey, this is chapter one, chapter two. No, it, it, it's, a, it's a document that has a flow to it. The reason I say that, I feel anyway, when we read the beginning of Mark chapter five, it really 
in some ways is connected to the end of chapter 4 in that Jesus, uh, uh, I'm not going to read up the whole, but it's, it's the incident where he's coming across uh, in the boat and he rebukes the wind and the sea, right? And if I, if I just pick up at verse, uh, this is Mark, this is 4, I'll, I'll pick up at 39. He gets up, Jesus gets up, rebuked the wind and the waves, quiet, be still. The wind died down, it was completely calm. He says to the disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? <laughs> they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves will bite. You know, you could, if you put yourself in that, I can't imagine, you're just looking at each other, what just happened? What just happened? You know, like the, the literally the, the storm and the waves is come and everything is calm. But the reason I bring this up and I think this is in terms of the application for for us. That is a demonstration of, an, let's say, a power with an external struggle, right? So the disciples are on the boat. There's a storm coming at them. In the beginning of the next chapter, what we see, let, let's call it, just bear with me for a second, an internal struggle. Like this dude, this guy is has a demon. So it really, in some ways, if you want to think of it like this, this is a demonstration of power and authority with an external struggle and an internal struggle. And I think it's important as believers to recognize, because that's a literally a demonstration of Jesus' power and authority over the believers, extern- those things that are coming at you in life that you have absolutely no control over, right? But when Jesus is on the scene, when Jesus is brought into the picture, when the power of God is exerted on whatever that scenario is, and everyone, you know, whether it be the job, whether it be the finances, whether it be the uh, relationships, whatever it is, when the power of God um, is released into that situation, it's taken care of. The, at the beginning of, the, of chapter 5, this internal, now, and we'll, I'll talk about this in a, in, a, in a minute, we're talking about an unbeliever, right? And, and we'll, we'll talk about it in a second. But for the believer that has this internal struggle, whether it be anxiety, whether it be whatever, but it's an internal anger, whatever the, the re- when the power and presence of God are brought to bear on that, that changes things. It absolutely changes things. I say this to the folks at home too, because as you continue going to church, like, Trusting God can become just a, two words that people use, right? And I'm trusting God, or I'm praying for you, and so on and so on. Is service over now? They're coming down. Okay, let's close with our prayer. No, I'm almost done. We'll, we'll pick up in two years when I come back. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, when the presence and power of God are brought on those internal things, God, the power of God is released. But, oh, I know what the point I was going to make is, literally it's incumbent on that Christian, not the pastor, not, the, not that person's husband or wife, to trust God. And was, uh, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, trust the Lord with all your heart, what? Lean not on your own understanding, right? I don't know how this could ever get fixed. I don't know how. But, and my wife and I, I've done this on more than one occasion. I'm not, uh, you know, just you, I just, what, because we found, I just sit, I know the couch is right here. I said, we're trusting God. You know what we're going to do? We're going to trust God. Oh, <laughs> you know, what, what, like what a clever like idea, how about how about we Christians? We start to trust God. You know what I mean? Instead of and I'm you know, 
instead of talking about it, actually do it. And here's why that's important. Here's why it's important. Each of us individually, I don't care if you're here, you're 14 or you're 94, have to experience the power of God in our own life. Not that we don't all go through spiritual deserts. We all do. But it is important. It is important that we, as in, and, and I'm an associate pastor, like I, I, we have to experience the power and faithfulness of God. But, and it's by design. That's, what, that's why it's called an individual, like a relationship. It's not a religion. It's a relationship where we are, we're, we're experiencing the power of God. And then we look back, we can look back. And my wife and I, we talk about it. God was faithful. What are, what are we doing? Why are we, why are we wringing our hands over this when God was faithful here and here and over here and over here? Like, why, what? God, God left? God what? And, and so because our, we're so fickle in our minds, right? And we have, just like he is, right? We have these short memories, right? About God's faithfulness and goodness. And we're so, oh, what's going to happen? No, God's faithful. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So, that, that, I, I, I like that end of chapter 4, beginning of chapter 5. There's an external thing coming at these disciples. Oh, no. What's, and Jesus says, be still. Mm-hmm. And power of God, boop, right? The demon, he, so the, the boat floats right up to show he's in. The, 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 man, the demon-possessed man is coming around. And the demons inside know what's happening here, right? They, you can sense by how they're, they're, they're like, they know their time is limited. Um, the internal struggles that many times I don't want to go down I don't want to digress too much but you know as Christians we and I love the fellowship right but I, I do believe that we there needs to be an authenticity like if I'm struggling but sometimes there's a, a temptation to maybe put on a facade that <clears throat> you know um, but we need to trust God with those internal things that we don't have an answer for. But at the end of the day, Jesus is the answer for. The Bible tells us what? Cast your cares upon him, for he cares for you. That's literally every person in the room. No one is excluded. That's a wonderful thing. It gives each of us the opportunity to experience the faithfulness of God. Not talk about God's faithfulness to this person. No, to experience the faithfulness of God ourselves. Mm-hmm. And that, it, it, I mean, the, here's how I look at it. When I became a Christian, I wasn't looking to join a club. I wouldn't look, you know, the, 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 you know like, I'm, I'm not looking to join a club. But they were talking about having a real relationship with my creator. Now that is something I'm interested in. That's something, that sounds pretty cool, you know. And 40 years later, come to find out the things that they said, this is 1982, are true. Lo and behold, God is faithful. God is good. God does have good intentions. God does love me. All that stuff is true. And, you know, 40 years later, I'm finding, yeah, wow. Uh, I can speak confidently to my kids and grandchildren. Yes, yeah, God is faithful. And here's the lie. Anyway, let me, let me, let's keep going here because... Um, I'm, I'll just you just kick me in the shin or something like that. And it's like, I'm not gonna. Uh, <clears throat> I, I mean, I have a lot of notes here in terms of uh, I, what I really want to, you know, and, and especially when we, we're talking about a demon possession, I think it's it's important for everybody to keep in mind a Christian cannot be demon possessed. Okay, so that's not that's not a possibility. Um, this area of uh, where G, where the boat floats up onto is a no, uh, an area known and with reputation for idol worship. For it was um, it was uh, like a Hellenistic um, the gods, the uh, like the twelve Olympic gods, where where the idols and so on. So uh, pig um, I, uh, where the uh, the sacrifices, the pigs were the were the, the sacrifice to the idols and so on. So 
you know, kind of, I, I guess, one of the things that I come away with, and, and those of you that maybe have wandered from the Lord, when, when the, the unbeliever um, exposes himself many times without knowing it to demonic forces, right? And, and, and we know that, that Satan, even for the Christian, has like these, drops these little breadcrumbs. Satan will drop these little breadcrumbs for you to just follow. And what, what blows me away is like the progressive nature of sin, right? Like the progress, meaning that, well, you know, this guy, he just started as a high school kid smoking weed on the side of the, you know, outside the gym. And, but how did he get two years later to be putting a needle in his arm? You know what I mean? So the, the progressive nature of sin is real. And so Satan gets a person with these little attractive little breadcrumbs to follow down this path that leads to a, a bad place. And I think, because I'm sure this, this guy that we're reading about here at the beginning of the chapter did not start out like this. So that's important to understand. I think the other, the other thing from a, from a Christian standpoint, uh, What is in First Samuel? First Samuel, I think it's First Samuel fifteen, when the prophet Samuel is is um, rebuking. Um, yes, no, uh, he's rebuking the king. Uh, it'll come to me on the way home. It'll come to me. Uh, uh, and he says, "Rebellion." Hear this. This is really is as the sin of witchcraft. Interesting, right? It, it, that's a very interesting concept. Rebellion that uh, is as a sin of witchcraft. It's like First Samuel. Boy, I have it written down here. Um, is as a sin of witchcraft, and that when you that is a very sobering thought. When I'm walking in obedience to Jesus, I, I here's how the picture in my mind. I have this umbrella of spiritual protection. Protecting me from the fiery darts of the enemy, right? Because Satan wants to take you out. Let's, 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 at the end of the day, Satan wants to stop what God wants to do in you and how God wants to use you, number one. But he also he just wants to take you out. So as I walk in submission and obedience, not perfection, by the way. Don't, I'm not talking about perfection. None of us are perfect. We all are sinners. We all fall short. Fall short. But I have a desire to walk in the steps that God has for me. I have that umbrella of protection. When, even as a believer, I, you know what, God, I'm good. I'm good. And, and I step out. I'm coming out from under that umbrella of protection. And in a sense, I'm not saying, again, not, we're not talking about demon possession, but certainly giving the devil a foothold in my life that otherwise would not be there. So in uh, in First Peter, we're not going to take the time to turn there. The believer is warned to be sober-minded. This is First Peter chapter five, verse eight. Be sober-minded. Be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. And, and, and so I think those warnings to the early church, to the, they're still right as relevant today as they ever were. We need to be sober-minded knowing that, that Satan would love to derail what God wants to do you, in you, in your family, in your marriage, in your children, and, and so on. So it's just something to keep in mind. Can we be possessed? No. Can the Christian expose himself to demonic influence? Yeah. Which is why the Bible says, hey, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. If your arm, if you right, cut it off. The, the, not that we're literally going to do those things, but it's what, what Scripture is telling. You be ruthless with your flesh. And don't give the devil an opportunity to do what he wants to do. Um, 
I'm gonna. I'm gonna um, wrap up with uh, one last thought. If 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 you would, uh, when when we look at when we look at the uh, and we didn't get a chance to read it, but the the woman who pressed through the crowd. <clears throat> so Jairus in this chapter, Pastor, you're gonna come back and do this. This is a great chapter. Jairus comes and. And uh, Jairus is one of the synagogue leaders later in this chapter. He's one of the synagogue leaders. And he uh, falls at Jesus' feet, begging him to uh, come and uh, heal his son. The interesting thing is that he's a synagogue leader. If you go back a couple chapters, Jesus was really mistreated in the synagogue just a few chapters prior to, uh, to this one. Jesus doesn't say... He doesn't look at him and say, what, after the way you, because he's literally, literally, he's a synagogue leader. If the way you treated me, you want me to go and heal you? And why is that worth noting? Well, there's nothing, and it's beautiful, there's nothing, once I, I come to my knees to Jesus, there's nothing that I've ever done that is going to cause him to, A, stop loving me or reject me. He didn't say, well, did you take, did, are, are, are you going to get those guys off my back? You know, like, no. There was no strings attached. Did you learn your lesson? You know, there were no, there were no, he, he was going to go with him. He was going to go with him. So, and I'll be honest with you. Um, when I became a Christian, I was probably, I was 23. The revelation that God loved me was, I, I, how come people don't know this? That's, I just remember myself saying it, like to the, to, how come people don't know that God loves them? How, and it was just mind blowing. And I, I, I think sometimes, people wrestle with that, that God loves us unconditionally. And once we are submitted and at his feet, he is in a position to do in us and with us that which he wants. Guys, we're going to close with a word of prayer. I appreciate your time and uh, your patience. And um, it, again, I want to thank you guys. It's been really a joy to, uh, to uh, be with you and just to be able to share. Father, we thank you tonight, Lord. We thank you for your word and uh, the changing power of your word. God, um, help us, Lord, to continue to uh, pursue you and, God, that we would have a hunger and a thirst <coughs> for your word. Uh, God, continue that work that you've begun in each of our hearts, whether it's been for two weeks or 20 years, God, continue that work. And, Lord, it's our heart's desire, wherever your will brings us, to bring you honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Joe. Thank you. Thank you.